We are transitioning out of instruction and into data. And as we said at the beginning, we know that you have so much data at your fingertips. And it's how are we managing that? What are we doing with that? How is it changing our practice? You know this year we rolled out a data dashboard. And already reflecting on the effectiveness of that, how did we use that, how is it displayed to refine and tweak that and make that even better for folks next year. So that's one of your first links on this tool that you see on the screen now. This is our data dashboard with data as it relates to all the goals that we talked about at the beginning here. We have MAP, we have CERT, we have a lot of data as you can see. Each of you have a school data file. And within that file, you will eventually see archived data from this year in your school folder. Right now, you have all of your data as it relates to what occurred in your building this school year. You have transition data, if that's applicable to you. So you can see those kids feeding to you. And then eventually soon, you will have archived data so that you can have all of this data as you're working and, and looking at things and making decisions in your building next year. And then we will start fresh with this data dashboard as we start next school year. This next phase is again an effort, just like we went through with instruction, to help you understand how do I stay on top of data? How do I manage that so that I'm really doing something with it? What can a recursive process look like, sound like, if I need some assistance in that area to, to develop that more for my team? We do have a, um, a visual. We are all such visual people, and we felt like this, this cycle, this visual, really helped us think about how we could help you with sifting through all of this data. So obviously, first of all, there has to be some method for how you're gathering that in your building. What does that look like for you right now? Um, once it's gathered, what do you do with it? Who's around the table? How are you analyzing that? What's the frequency? What's the goal? If we've got data, what's our goal with what we're going to do with this data? And then a lot of times we would see as an area of growth this year when we were on school visits, everybody has a ton of data and you're tracking data for kids, but where we feel like we can support you more is, so what are you doing with this for kids? What is your plan? If you know all this data about this child, what are you doing as a result of that? So that's where you get into the fourth part of that action planning. And then that constant recursive going back to it. How are we monitoring? If we come up with a plan, when are we coming back together as a team to see how that plan's working? And, you know, teachers track data all the time. They, when they assign something, they're putting it where? What, if they're assigning an assignment or giving a test and they're scoring it, where does that go? infinite campus. So there's a natural, authentic way that they're tracking data. If, if, if a child is performing regularly with that consistent, authentic tracking, that's great. But we also know that we have kids, as we're entering it into infant campus, and we're seeing MAP scores, and we're seeing CERT scores, and we're seeing K-PREP scores, and we're seeing that triangulation of data that this kid's struggling. This is kind of what we're phasing into because there's already a natural way that you track data for all kids. And I think the other thing that was an aha for us in these school visits is that we don't want, we want a laser-like focus. Teachers are already tracking data for all their kids because they have to, right? We want a laser-like focus for those students who are showing us time after time triangulated data. There's that data speaking to us and we have to do something. And I think that's going to help you help your teachers manage this more. That was feedback we received that we've got data binders, we've got this spreadsheet, we have this, but nothing was being done with it. So we're trying to shift from having all that data. You, you determine that at your school. If you're doing that and that's working for you, you keep doing what you're doing. But we heard from many of you that we're tracking all this data and we're not doing anything with it. So this PLC suggested practice around data, this visual, and something that Joe's going to explain to you uh, that we're adding, we think will, 
will solve and be responsive to what you're telling us in terms of how do we really track and manage data for those kids that constantly are showing us we need to do something different for them beyond quality best practice tier one instruction. We're going to shift now into a similar PLC process for data that Jenny took you through with quality instruction. And of course, those two things, what I see in high quality PLCs is data and quality instruction is in every single PLC every single time teachers sit down to look at kids. So as Dr. Webb mentioned in his opening remarks, he's big on data. I think we all knew that from the first time um, we got together last year and we had all those highlighted um, indicators from the K-PREP scores. So we know he's big on data, but we're all big on data. We're not big on data just as numbers, but numbers as it transfers to kids, as it indicates what we can do with kids to help ensure their success. So as you think about the data PLCs that we're going to do, it's really around that. And again, it's going to be scenario based and a sample, but we hope that out of that, you'll see things that you can take back to your building. So I just want to give you an example from yesterday. I met with Scott social studies teachers and I gave them really big data because I know they wanted it. In this particular example, it's summative ACT data. They're social studies teachers in high school. They wanted to know what was the ACT data for reading in their building. They had already seen some of it. So in what I'm going to explain to you, I think is a good sort of sample of the way that data dig happens that's rich and powerful for kids. So they started, they were a little disappointed that the number went down from 17 to 18, although that's not the same kids. Then they asked, well, what were those kids like in eighth grade? Did we move them or not? still with that big summative number. Then we went to data sets that have been prepared for them so that they could click on every single junior and they wanted to see how their individual kids did as juniors. Then they wanted to see which kids got close. Also through the data set, they could click on any kid who, you need a 20 to be benchmark, any kid who got an 18 or a 19, they could click on and see those kids' names and that leads to what are we going to do with those kids in PLCs and in instruction between August 15th and the end of the year to see that we could get as many of those kids their college readiness measurement. But then a person said, well, wait a minute, what about the kids who are going to take the ACT next year? The 10th graders who will walk in the door August 15th as juniors who are going to take the ACT. And they, they said, look, can we look at those so we can see where they're ending so we can see where they're starting. And did the same thing. Based on the CERT, last ACT those sophomores took, they were able to identify the kids who made it and the kids who didn't. And then he started thinking about what are we gonna do with those kids who didn't in our social studies class around reading. Super, super powerful. Um, then they said, you know what? The ACT doesn't give us any useful data in terms of skills to study. It doesn't, it's a flat score, right? And they said, how about if we look at the first, the first um, search score, because that will tell us for those kids who we know are close what their skill deficits are. That is magic. That is the questions that they had we had data sets for. So it's so much more than numbers. It is that inquiry part on the part of teachers to think about what does the data tell us in terms of identifying kids. And then you can imagine after that, if there's a particular skill deficit in reading, then it's all instruction, okay? So that was super powerful, and that's really what we're going to articulate here shortly in the sample PLC. So um, I just wanna mention too, before you see this PLC page, it's on your table, I'll refer to it in just a second, is that what we're looking at is, we have about 85% of our kids who are doing really well in making progress. Uh, for those kids, you're really tracking that information through IC existing sets of data. It's for the 15%, 10 to 15%, Kim Mott mentioned how much she appreciated this. There's additional process for the kids who need it. So as you see this PLC process we're gonna roll out um, that's leveled, complex, and recursive, it's really around those kids who are struggling so that we can help them in their struggle and get them to progress. So that's super important. So at this point, if you will find on your table, you'll see a PLC process that at the top just says data PLC. 
you have a couple of different sheets. So we want to make sure everybody has the PLC page that says data PLC. First, what I'd like you to do at the top of the data PLC page um, are five concepts, they're bulleted, that undergird working with data with kids in PLCs. So you see them at the top, those five bullets? I want you to take one minute, it's not started yet, but read those five bullets and if something is fuzzy to you, like I'm not sure what that is, just put a squiggle on that word or concept, okay? And if something you see there is a concept that you think is super powerful, put an exclamation point. Does everybody understand your task? You're just reading the five bullets at the top. Your time starts now. So going from data to appropriate action and setting up systems to address what the data shows. Okay, good. Anybody else? A question or comment about any of the concepts in the first five bullets? Okay. So, what you'll see next is a scenario. So will everybody please look at the scenario? It's a pretty common scenario. And what you're seeing is the scenario is based on map or cert data depending on the level of the school. With big data, with big data, the principal and leadership team, as you can see, have seen that there's some trend data indicating that many students are not making consistent growth compared to the peers in reading and math. So again, we're now looking at the kids who are not making consistent growth, not a leveled recursive process for all the kids who are. And the principal decides that they're going to have PLCs twice a month to look at this work, and they want a re recursive structure to make it happen. Sorry to, to do that, not have you read it, but we're in a hurry. So now you see that situation. How many of you would say you've experienced that situation from summative data the previous year? where you see some kids aren't making growth. You should all be raising your hands, right? So we know that. So what you're seeing next, and this I'm going to give you five minutes to dig into, is a half year plan for PLCs to sustain work around that, OK? So again, you'll see it in two ways. You'll see what's happening with teachers what's being managed, required of teachers, and a process. And on, on the right side, you're going to see administrative management of that instructional work. Okay, your five minutes starts now. You're digging in this in the same way you did with Jenny's quality instruction. Things that are not clear to you that you have a question about and things that you love that you want to take back to your building. This wonderful thing of as soon as you see the stuff, you see a part of it and you start talking about how you're going to use it. Fantastic. We just want to make sure everyone is seeing all of the stuff that's in the PLC um, descriptor here and in the scenario and in the cycle of stuff that happens. So I'm not saying you haven't, um, but I just want to check on one little thing that as consultants we um, wanted to make sure we emphasized. So even before I get to any questions, could I call everybody's attention to under PLC focus on the left side, the third chunk Everybody see that third chunk that starts with each PLC has the same structure using appropriate data? So there are uh, one, two, three PLCs. Does everybody see that? So it's the third chunk, but it's divided into three PLCs. If you'll just take a few seconds to yourself and note what is recursive in each of those PLCs. What happens every time with the kids who are struggling? What is the process? Everybody engages in with the kids who are struggling. So they've been identified. What happens recursively with those kids in each of those PLCs? So you can just make a note to the side. Identify that for yourself. Something that happens recursively, you don't have to put it in the exact words that are there. Each time they meet for those 15% of the kids who are struggling, what do they evaluate and look at and do? Okay? So they started with concerned students and she said they're identifying if those kids are still concerned students or if there are other students who weren't con stu concerned students who now are. So it's a living list, right? If you identify 20 kids in a teacher's um, course load of kids that start that way, 
by the time you get here, maybe it's down to 12. But they may not be the same 12 that started. Ideally, some of those 20 would no longer be, be struggling, and for different reasons, some other kids may now be struggling. So it's a leave, living, breathing thing. Awesome, good. What determines if the kids stay on the list or not? Progress. So if they're on the list because they're not making progress, then recursively, what is, what is the team's work? What, what aren't we doing? What can we do that will help them be successful? So that's not rocket science, and that's the way we typically look at it, but it's important to see that in concert with the data. That it's not just, well, I think the kid's doing fine. What's the data? What's the data to say he's really making progress in substantial ways? And I, I didn't say this at the beginning. This isn't all quantitative data. There's qualitative data, right? There's rubric-based assessments. There's all kinds of stuff that informs this. That the rabbit hole of data goes a lot of places, and you won't be going wrong if you're looking for objective measures that give us information that's critical to these kids' success in the key areas we've identified. So, awesome. Did anybody have any other questions or see anything in this PLC structure as designed for a half a year that you thought was still fuzzy or wanted to highlight for the group? So our effort is to match that cycle of quality instruction. That, that's our goal, is that we're modeling what we're asking teachers to do, what we're asking you to support teachers in doing in classrooms. And so, again, we've, we have the film, and um, just keep that in mind as we go through the day, because we know how much information this is and the delivery of it. We're trying our best to make that match for you as you're processing this but then also gearing up for leading that with your staff. What is it from what you just experienced with the data PLCs that spurs your reflection? What do you want to capture and use? This same thing that you did with Jenny's quality instruction section. 